Hong San Mu, top civil servant in the vast eastern state of Shan and former army captain, says he's sorry about what happened to Mian Ong, especially over such a small piece of land that he probably didn't own anyway. But does that make you feel bad that somebody you felt so awful about land and land with the, and the military allegedly took it that he took his own life, he burned himself to death in public. This is about the new world. By my life, you are not a good job. See, I don't know. 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 If Myandong's story seems a tragedy born of the past, just a few miles away, trouble is very much in the present on the building site next to Inle Lake, one of the country's premier tourist attractions. <coughs> Ong Jo Mol is fighting the hotel zone, which swallowed up his land after the military junta stepped down in 2011. He says the $700 or so the government offered for his 14-acre holding was nowhere near enough. Other villagers who live nearby say they did receive some compensation, but they say that it's not sufficient and they're still struggling. ดีรู้ไม่ยืนเลยไม่ยาวเลยป่าวเดียวสิครับเยอะแล้วเจ้าเราจะน้องเลยอาจจะขี่มันอยู่เจ้าเจ้าเจ้าเราเลยเจ้
He was the winner of the FT's second annual Jones Mothner Memorial Prize for his reporting and exposés of corruption. And just last year, he published a new book, The Looting Machine, Warlords, Oligarchs, Corporations, Smugglers, and the Theft of Africa's Wealth, which will be out in paperback soon. It will. Okay. Available in all good bookshops. Good. Uh, please join me in welcoming Tom Burgess. Um, I didn't want to go on for too long. I think these things are best when they're part of a discussion. Uh, thanks for the money, by the way. <laughs> uh, um, I just wanted to just give just a few thoughts of how the idea for this series came together and then what I got up to in Ethiopia um, and then maybe a couple more ideas we can have a discussion about. Uh, it, the, the whole thing began about a year ago um, when Michael, you saw there, and Polita and I and a few other reporters around the FT started talking to each other about the fact that we'd anecdotally all come to the conclusion that there was um, a kind of land rush taking place, or more and more interest in land cross-border land deals, and more and more opposition to them. Um, I remember the first time I encountered this idea had been years before that, but in 2008, when I was the Southern Africa correspondent, I covered the coup in. Madagascar. I'm sure you're all intimately aware of all the details of that coup. Where's Madagascar? <laughs> Down and left. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, I'm afraid. We can do afterwards if anyone's interested. But the point is that part of the reason that there was such public anger against the, the president he was ousted was that he had done a deal with a Korean, South Korean company to lease an enormous chunk of Madagascar, which is, which is big, but I mean, this was a huge area of it. Um, for uh, crops to be grown and exported uh, without, it seemed initially, any fee being paid to Madagascar. And that was part of the trend in 2007. You'll remember there was a big, before the financial crisis, there is a now forgotten food crisis when prices for stable crops went through the roof in 2007 as part of the commodity boom. And what happened was that um, very rich and normally powerful countries suddenly found themselves impotent in the face of this global market that stopped working. Saudi Arabia, um, some of the Arab Emirates, many of the places like South Korea, many of the big industrialized food importers found that no matter how much they were prepared to pay, the market seized up because big exporters in North Africa or South America or whatever had panicked, um, realized quite rightly that very high food prices could lead to um, mass uh, anger on the streets of their country, so they put export bans on their staple crops, and suddenly places like Saudi Arabia, normally so influential, staring down the barrel of their own uh, food riots. And out of that food price crisis that eventually abated of its own accord um, came this idea, which if you think about it, is, 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 is pretty crazy in the, in the history of um, the, the world economy, the idea that you go into someone else's country and you buy an enormous chunk of their land. I mean, for, for the vast majority of human history, that would only have ever happened by force. Um, so you start to have deals like the one in Madagascar, um, some, some, some Chinese deals, some of which were exaggerated, but there were some that happened in Africa, and deals as well from um, India and Arab countries into Africa, also deals from North America into South America, various flows that we were hearing about as reporters anecdotally on this increase in cross-border land investment. And it was accompanied by a lot of uh, campaign groups and NGOs making an awful lot of noise about this epidemic of land grabbing, some of which certainly was land grabs, but we thought it was maybe um, a more complicated question than that. There were certainly instances like those that Steve and Michael uh, brilliantly re recorded in, in Myanmar of just the wholesale expropriation of land. Um, but there were also cases where the, uh, the host government was quite happily inviting foreign investors in land in parts of Africa out of, in, in, in good faith, right, um, as, a, as a part of a strategy to try 
to increase food security, to increase food production, to group together lots of small inefficient farms into big ones that might, some would argue, be a path out of poverty. So off we went um, gradually on our different trips. Michael to Myanmar, Felita Clark is a phenomenal writer, and if anyone hasn't seen it and would like to, the, the piece from Indonesia in this series is, is fantastic. Um, about the, the Norwegians trying to stop deforestation. Um, includes uh, a, a village in the middle of the jungle taking hostage some uh, bulldozers, I think, wasn't it? An extraordinary tale. Um, and so off I went to Ethiopia, and we picked Ethiopia because um, it was one of the first countries that seemed to really embrace this idea. One of the first governments who said, right, yeah, we're up for this. We, want to, we have enormous amounts of fertile land and very little else. Um, we are going to be at the forefront of this kind of, um, one of these last frontiers of globalization, I suppose. I mean, everything else pretty much works in a global market, but land doesn't. Obviously can't be transported, but, 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 was, but, but seemed from our early research to, to, to be globalizing. And Ethiopia is an interesting place as well because it, obviously it's synonymous with hunger. But in and, and those famines of the 80s and, um, and the first mass famine that was ever broadcast, uh, the 80, 84 famine. Uh, but latterly, Ethiopia has kind of found this swagger, right? It's one of the fastest growing countries in, uh, in, in Africa. Um, it's adopted this kind of Chinese model of crushing dissent, but also having um, uh, very, very fast economic growth um, and, and trying to trying to suggest that that's a, um, an acceptable trade-off. Um, and with Ethiopia, as with all of the countries we visit, and all of the countries that are starting to invite or accept cross-border investment in land, we found this sort of, this, 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 one of the few things that unites all these places, as we were saying there, is just a basic fact about land, that unlike, it's not a resource, it's, a, it's, it's almost an identity. Um, especially in Africa, if you think back through colonial history, think back to uh, East Africa and um, the Mau Mau Rebellion or, or the nature of apartheid in South Africa was basically a question of land. There is nothing more sensitive in Africa, and, and, and I spent years living there, than the, than the question of land. Um, what we found in Ethiopia was like any good story, the fact that, 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 that our initial impressions were a way to a kind of window onto the human soul, in a way. And, and, and a story that was, I think, uh, like, like Myanmar, but maybe slightly different. In Myanmar, it's, it's a, it does seem to be one big, pretty horrific land grab. And there's not a lot of people, from what I understood from Michael's reporting, there's not a lot of people who would stand up and say, you know what, this is all going to work out for the best. <coughs> uh, but in Ethiopia, there is a deep division of opinion on whether massive land investments that are going on are the future or the most terrible act of dispossession. Um, and it's a very difficult story to report from that point of view, especially because a lot of the coverage of this um, has been quite lazy so far. A lot of the coverage of, of land deals in Africa has been based, has been written from London for one thing, or um, New York, um, and uh, it's it's of quite often driven by pretty simplistic reporting, and reporting that doesn't really get under the skin of somewhere like Ethiopia, where everything, in politics anyway, is ethnic. So. To try and summarise it, that what we found was that the the Saudis had taken a very large lease. We didn't find this out, but this was widely known. This element of it, the Saudis had taken a very large lease, one of several large leases that had been given out by the Ethiopian government to foreign investors. And this Saudi lease was in a place called Gambella. Has anyone been to Ethiopia? Um, in a place called Gambella, which is down by South Sudan, which is in the lowlands which was never traditionally part of what used to be Ethiopia, one of, the, one of the few parts of Africa that's never really been colonized and has tremendous pride in that. The, the, the core of Ethiopia is basically an old empire run by, for a long time, uh, Rastafari, who became highly Selassie, and, was, and um, him and his father repelled the uh, Italian colonialists, about which they're very, very proud indeed, quite rightly. Um, 
And that Highland Empire has been spreading out into the Lowlands for a long time. The, the, the paradox of it all is that in the Highlands, where all the power resides, is also where the, all the hunger is. On these kind of thin soils, um, other places where every 10 years or so, uh, for many years, there were terrible famines with tens or hundreds of thousands of people dying. The lowlands, by contrast, where people have darker skin, speak different languages, and uh, worship different gods, those places are, are incredibly fertile. So there's been a very, very long process in Ethiopia of the highland elites gradually trying to impose their control on the fertile lowlands. And the Saudi land investment, an enormous rice farm funded by a billionaire called Mohammed al the richest man in East Africa, a Saudi Ethiopian. That land investment is, if you're one of the people who's opposed to it, an extension of this, these centuries-long process of the Highlanders dispossessing and plundering the rich lands of the lowlands. Now, Stephen, I assume we're going to need one of these videos, um, the, the first one. So, it seemed to us on arriving, and it took us months to, uh, of, of battling to get a visa, the, the, such as the sensitivity and the occasionally kind of Stalinist approach of the um, Ethiopian communications authorities, that it, um, it, it took a very, very long time to get a visa, and they initially refused to let us go to Gambella, but we did arrive, possibly coloured by that, by that experience, um, we did arrive thinking... That this was going to this is a very clear cut story of mass dispossession of, of the Saudis conspiring with the Highlanders to um, boot all the lowlanders out um, and to claim their fertile land and export rice that would um, help the national balance of payments and help the national government but just add further to the dispossession of the Anwak as the main group in uh, Gambada is called. But then we went and interviewed the man who runs yeah. Um, I went to, we went to interview in Addis Ababa before we went down to the lowlands. We went to interview the man who runs the farm. So this is the chief executive of Saudi Star, which is the billionaire Alamudi's company, which runs this enormous farm. I think we never quite found this out, but it, it seems to be uh, certainly one of the biggest, if not the biggest, rice farm in Africa. And this is what he says about Gambella in the face of this is him responding to various NGO reports and, and critics. Gambella is a region in Ethiopia which it was left behind, which is not developed, which is very remote. And uh, what South Star has brought is investment, capital investment, and technology transfer. Investment in large scale has been portrayed as a very sensitive issue by the Western media. And our commercial farm investment also was portrayed as a, a very sensitive investment and high negative impact on the people on the ground. That is very painful for somebody like me, who's also an African. And uh, the people who, the, some NGOs and activists, uh, have crocodile tail for are my own people. They're Ethiopians. And I care, and we care, the Germans also care, much more than the activists. So the chairman is Adam Moody. Um, a strong argument, no? Um, why should why should Al Moody and the people who work for him be stopped by, as he says, a handful of Western NGOs from investing in an enormous rice farm that will bring modern farming technology to um, what is ultimately a pretty undeveloped area? It is quite a compelling argument. And when we got down there, we heard from a lot of, we met a lot of people on the farm whose fathers were uh, still using um, an ox to plow their field. And these were guys who were being trained as agronomists and who were using um, really advanced farming technology and Saudi Star was giving them all these skills. Um, and we, and it's pretty extraordinary. It's a pretty extraordinary place, that farm. And it was having its first harvest while, while we were there. But as ever, as ever, there's another side or two. Um, and from Gambella, we went back to Addis, and then we went down to um, Kenya. 
So in Nairobi, a lot of the people who've had to flee Gambala over the last 10 or 15 years now live. Um, so we'll come to we'll, we'll get to this kind of in a sec. This is just this is the last the last thought, and then we can we can discuss it. Um, so on the outskirts of Nairobi, um, in Kenya, as we know, there are lots of different refugee communities. A lot of Somalis in the north, particularly. But on the outskirts, of one part of the outskirts of Nairobi, um, it's a big sprawling town. Um, there's a place where the Anwak refugees live. So a lot of these people started to arrive after 2003. And in 2003, uh, late that year, um, there was an ambush on a car driving through Gambella. It's never the, the exact circumstances of what happened are still disputed. But that was the pretext for Highlanders, so people already aligned with the central government, um, Tigrayans, ethnically most of them, um, with the complicity of the local armed forces, started to slaughter the Anarch in their own country, and they killed hundreds of them. Um, and a lot of people fled, including this guy, and they now live uh, in various camps in Kenya and in South Sudan. And when you talk to them about Saudi Star's farm, they don't really dispute you see, a lot, a, lot, a lot of the coverage of the land grabs has been slightly, I think, slightly skewed because people are obsessed with the idea that that particular plot, that chair, used to belong to that guy, and now it's been taken and given to someone else. The, what these guys, I kept asking them about that, and kept saying, okay, but the Saudi Star area wasn't that just bush, basically. And they'll say, well, yeah, well yeah, basically it was, yeah, but it was our bush. And one of them put it very well, and it's quoted, he's quoted in the piece, and he said, well, in the world as a whole, we don't utilize every last bit of land. That, that, that doesn't mean you can just walk in and say it's yours. Um, and f for them, you know, they they don't they don't have that much of a problem with um, the idea of commercial farming, the idea of sophisticated techniques, or whatever it may be. It's, but it's much deeper than that. It's you know, this is the land where my umbilical cord is buried, and I cannot go back because we have been dispossessed. And any farming project or any lease, um, no matter how sophisticated the kind of laser guided technology that levels the fields, or how good the cement is for the uh, canals, or how well meaning people like Jamal Ahmed are, it will always be bound up in that. And just one second, we'll just finish with this, and then please, let's have questions. So, this is another view on Gamba from uh, one of the refugees who fled in 2003 um, on Montaro. killed in Sal because of what happened in Ethiopia. Our brothers and mothers, even I don't know where my mother is now since 2003. So when I recall uh, what happened and think about what happened in Ethiopia, my mind is still disturbed. Uh, so uh, it is something which is very bad. Our land has been taken. Our, people, our, our women have been raped, and our fathers have been killed, and they are still hunting in the village military, are there, raping, killing, all these things. So, uh, even I don't want to remember about what happened because it will disturb. Yeah, yeah, we have to leave, but uh, the recent media reports about hundreds of uh, peacefully demonstrating Oromo students yeah. being killed in the Addis area because of land grab in the Addis area as well. It's part of the same <coughs> question of, of, of Oromia, or or Oromia, just the area north exactly, of Addis yeah. Ababa. Absolutely, this, yeah. this whole question of land, so Gambella's yeah. been festering for a long time, and now it's starting to explode uh, in, the, in the most populous area just north of Addis. Absolutely. Have you, have you, this is something you've been Yeah, they're peacefully yeah. demonstrating totally. and killed by, by the Sigrid government. You know, that's the one in... But this, this yeah. is the problem, that it's yeah, the increasingly problem. repressive Ethiopian government. Yeah. Um, 
will not tolerate dissent. But exactly. it's also exactly. trying to marshal not only land protests, but um, it, it puts forward very impressive economic exactly. growth figures that a lot of economists don't believe. But at the same time, it's issuing famine appeals. You know, in the north, again, there, there, there's a big risk of famine because of El Nino this year and the bad rains. Um, but with Aromi, absolutely. This is, I think, people who know Ethiopia better than I do say this is this is one of the biggest challenges. To well, Aromi is right Europe. around Addis. You know, it's bordering the Precisely. capital city. Yeah, capital we drove, we drove up, 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 up. It's a real estate. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thanks. Well, yeah, yeah, thank you you know, I thought you were walking out in protest. <laughs> 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 uh, anyone, anyone, anyone else? Any, any thoughts or questions? Yeah, please. Do we, um, do we, do we, we have any needs? Uh, yeah. Was there any effort made by the Saudi to compensate the original inhabitants for it? Uh, no, but with good reason, because there weren't really any. There were um, so there are some areas. That, this is the huge question. Is, is kind of one step before that. Is in Gambala were lots of people living on the land that has now been given to foreign investors, and in, in some areas yes, and in some no, but. The, the problem really is just two different definitions of land use. Well, no, I understand that there's two different definitions. Yeah. Okay. That, that, so it's hard but, to know who to compensate. Well, so that's part of that's part of what I'm asking. I mean, you know, we we have land here that was uh, um, occupied by Native Americans, some of which has been ceded to them, and which they would not give give up to any corporations. On the other hand, they have managed to use other land to to very profitably, shall we say? Uh, yes. In various ways, so so you know, so we certainly have some experience. So that with came that. up, actually. And I'm just wondering, is, is there any kind of equivalent? So there's two, well, I've made two points there. One is that um, they pay a very very low, very small lease. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, a, like a few, three dollars a hectare. Like, it's an incredibly small lease, but that's deliberate. I mean, the government's policy is we've got a real to try to attract large scale investment, so mm -hmm. you charge a lease. With the the where the history of Native Americans came up was in a bar in Addis mm -hmm. when we were talking about this whole question. Um, obviously, much of the best reporting is done. Well, <laughs> I don't know what to do. <laughs> 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 the jobs. Um, the um, Steve is obviously <laughs> dedicated <laughs> bar room reporter. Um, um, we were suggesting, me and Chai, to be some amazing that maybe this was a bit draconian, the way uh, local and local people in Gambo were being treated to make way for investors. And the Ethiopian guy we were talking to, um, who used to manage Bob Marley's son, um, he said, hang on a second, like, what about the way Native Americans were treated? What about the way the Mason Dixon land went down? What about the, uh, the way it's treated the indigenous inhabitants of Tasmania or large parts of Southeast Asia or Africa. And I mean, he had a completely compelling point. So historically speaking, the way that land policy is being imposed on Gambella is pretty tame. Um, that's not to say there aren't huge problems with it. But this, yeah, this argument absolutely came up. But sorry, the, 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 the answer to your first question is no. They're basically no. very, very low. Now, the, the, I'm just saying the original habit because I don't know what the appropriate term is. Would they have been willing to accept payment? Uh, would there have been a way of compensating them? That at all? Because that was in the realm of possibility. It's the, yeah, this is something I tried to understand all the way through, and I kept reading different answers. The, I think the, the traditional Anoak structure, as I've understood it, is not nomadic, but it's not static either. Mm -hmm. So you'd have um, an area would be lived in and farmed for five years, and then you'd move. So you, it's quite reasonably, I think, the Anoak regard the whole Anoak zone, which isn't the whole of Gambella, because it's a big chunk, that's where this farm is, um, as kind of all theirs. But then Alice will come in and say, well, so who actually lives on this bit? So we're not living there at the moment, so there's no compensation for that particular bit. 
it's it's more a question of comes back to more less the question of compensation I found and more sort of self determination. So there were I was told, but I couldn't quite get to the bottom of this particular thread. I was told that there would be one or two big Anorak businessmen who were trying to set up big commercial farms, um, and but had received no kind of central government, no federal government support, certainly nothing on the scale of the political support and the guaranteed credit and what have you that the foreign investors got. And they, the, the Anorak we spoke to, regarded that as completely symptomatic of their belief that the land policy is just being used for kind of domineering by the highlanders of, of, of the lowlands. But the, 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 the principle of trying to improve farming techniques or try some bigger farms or try some property, I mean, that, that wasn't never the, the objection. It, it was more a sense of just being you know, dominated. But yeah, I never, I mean, the question of compensation was, wasn't well, I, I just said because I was trying to, I was trying to envision whether there was was a possible resolution as against no possible. Well, I think resolution. yeah, this is. I mean, and this is you know, this is this last last little bit I wrote was was kind of. So what? Where's this lad going to be in his Ethiopia show? I mean, there there's a very clear rift, and it's common to lots I think of of, of land disputes. Between those who benefit and those who don't, and the, um, there's a history of armed rebellion in Gambela. There, some of the guys we spoke to have been involved in those pretty small armed movements, but significant. But those people are now they were they were significant um, 20 years ago in the uprising against the old Um Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a sort of genuine joy among the guys who have been trained up in these. Fights. I mean, there is a sort of real pride that we encountered there, these guys who were, uh, you know, in their early 20s and they're, they're driving a tractor around and they understand about seed breeding and they're, you know, they're, they're serious people. Um, if Saudi Star and others like it are going to take hold, and, you, and, and I think it applies in places beyond Ethiopia, then it's, it's that kind of corruption, I suppose. Been a positive word, but I can't think what it is. The, um, the, rather than compensation, which as we saw in Myanmar, is just, I've never, I mean, especially when I was living in Nigeria, I mean, there's endless compensation schemes for land, for it just never works, right? You, you, there's no, that's a sustainable asset, your land, that is your identity. There's no amount of money. They're, they're not interchangeable, those two things, I don't think. Um, but you could, I mean, if Jamal Ahmed, the Saudi Star guy, is right, you could, you could build a genuine sense that this is like, like a company town, like you know, like Ford or uh, uh, Wesley in the UK or some, something like that. You, you could have a sense of that. But it's kind of direct, it's kind of tip for tap conversation. I just don't, I can't see that. I can't see that ever working. Um, it's really though it is just for us to be chatting. I should check if anyone else has that. Where did that last guy learn his English? A mod. The, what? the, 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 um, the refugee yeah. at the end. Yeah. Where did he learn his English? Uh, well, it, I mean, most people in Ethiopia just speak a bit of English. Well, a little bit. Well, he, but now he lives in Kenya. And he's lived in Kenya for 13 years now, where everybody speaks English all the time. And he probably knows a bit of Swahili too. But yes, I mean, do you mean that, that it was incredibly. I mean, he didn't strike me as your typical analog farmer. No, he's not a farmer. Um, he was a teacher, which I'm looking to check, but um, he, him and his friend I was talking to, one was a teacher, one was a nurse, so we'll put it in here. But no, he was quite a sophisticated guy, and, and one of the things that happened during the massacre, which happens in a lot of massacres that I've encountered, um, what is it, I think it's a little bit further up. Um, Sorry, this is actually something else we should mention. Um, yeah, a lot of the reason that people believe the massacre was planned was that a lot of intellectuals were targeted. So a lot of the, among a lot of the dead now, but a lot of those who survive are among the, the diaspora. The, so the refugees in Kenya are some of the best educated and like forced to flee. It's a very deliberate way of clearing out potential political leaders. 
um, one of the, the man who was the governor of Gambella State at the time was an American called Okele Okolo Akwechala, and he, the government tried to pressure him to parrot their line, which was um, that this was a kind of intra-ethnic conflict between different ethnic groups within Gambella had nothing to do with outsiders and certainly nothing to do with the military, although we now know that the military was actively complicit in the, in the, in the killings. And um, Okello had to flee and he made it to South Sudan and then he got asylum in Norway. And then in the years that followed he worked with the diaspora groups, other refugees in South Sudan and Kenya, Anoak all over the world, so there's a couple in Washington his son and um, some of these groups he was working he was working with seems to have been linked to the, the little pockets of armed resistance that there still are but mainly they're just kind of exiled political groups um, resistant to the central government and wanting more autonomy and wanting um, recompense for the massacre and, and opposing the land deals so anyway about a year ago months ago now, the, um, some agents came to the hotel in South Sudan where Okolo was staying, South Sudanese government is, took him, took him to an airfield, he was handed over to the Ethiopian Secret Service, he was flown to Addis and put in jail, which still is, and charged under the counter-terrorism law, which they now have in Ethiopia, it's all the rage in parts of Africa, uh, to have these kind of laws, and it, um, it's a very clearly a tool for brutally crushing dissent. Um, and so Okello, uh, his son is here and has been, has wrote a letter to the FT after this story. We tell a bit of Okello's story in the section of the Okello's got a picture of him, yeah. Um, and he's now been convicted, but under a different law, which suggests possibly the Ethiopians are going to back down. That there may have been some pressure from the, from the US, although that's not clear. Um, and it's not clear whether or not Obama mentioned it on his visit to the Ethiopian embassy. Um, it's a public bit, I think. He's section three. He's three. Um, so, yes, I just got a lot of time for your question. Quick second, take a quick second, take a question. Sure. Are the Saudis free to do whatever they want with the rice? Yes, so that's a whole other part of it. <laughs> it's that, um, and it's a part of uh, other similar land deals that on paper growing rice or whatever it may be in a poor, unopened hungry country and exporting it, which from the outside looks insane, right? Um, and that's a fellow. He's now in jail, awaiting his, he's been convicted of awaiting his sentence in a couple of weeks, <coughs> which could be death or it could be a long term imprisonment, we'll see. Um, um, the Assyrians <coughs> are free to do whatever they want. They, Jamal was very keen to stress that because of the dynamics of the global market at the moment, he can make more money selling his rice in Ethiopia, where it's a kind of growing staple. Um, but there is a plan to, they, they are growing specific different types of rice. Basically, there's, there's a rice that suits the Ethiopian palate, and there's one for the rest of East Africa, and there's where the particular type of rice, it's kind of fascinating to be able to it, like in a really geeky way, like types of rice. Um, they grow 92 different types of plants at the moment. And um, there's a particular type that's the kind of top end that goes over to over the Red Sea to Saudi and the uh, Arab Emirates. And yes, they're free to do whatever they want. And the, it does seem completely insane. But that's not, I think that's somehow, that's, uh, and I couldn't completely say when I arrived, but actually I, I kind of do buy the arguments about the complexities of food markets in those areas that if you, Part of Ethiopia's problem is that it is a huge trade deficit. And if you can grow a load of really good rice and export it, um, and have less of an enormous hole in your national finances, that's good too. Um, I mean, there was rice, there was food being exported during the Great Famines of the 80s. I mean, th this this is just how food markets... Was the food contrib contributed by the United States? Well, that was a whole other problem, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, then, these are the complexities of food. I've spent a lot of time in... Uh, Eastern Congo, we talked about it earlier. Um, you have a huge problem there, as you have in lots of other very hungry places, that food aid undercuts local farming production so it doesn't recover and so on. It's an incredibly difficult thing to meddle with the food market.
But to answer your question, yes, this happens free to do with the rock the rice. The story goes that the reason that farm was there in the first place is that after the food shock in 2007, the um, uh, Alamudi, the tycoon, went to see Yusuf Sandi, went to see the uh, king of Dubba, as it was then, and took him a bag of Ethiopian rice. And the king tried it and tasted it today. Um, go ahead. And blessed it, and then became the, 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 the um, Gave this blessing and the uh, Saudi style hall, and that's and the whole thing was originally meant to be geared towards the Saudi market. The reason some of the heat has gone out of this whole land debate to some extent is the food prices are coming down, so there's not the, the terrible urgency that there was in 2007, and the Saudis don't desperately need to plant their plants. At least, at least they're growing rice. Uh, so theoretically, it's, it's there for uh, domestic consumption, as opposed to growing flowers, mm. with, yeah. or tea. There's a lot of that in Ethiopia. Which flowers. you know, economic developers tell the Africans, that's what you do. You've got to earn that foreign exchange. Yeah. You convert your farmland to tulips. Yeah. And an Indian company. With the same did. result. Of an Indian company has done that. I think. I think there is an argument that you do have to earn foreign exchange to have a degree, if you buy this whole argument that development comes through foreign direct investment, then you need a degree of economic stability, and to achieve that you need a vaguely balanced trade profile. Like you, need, you need to be earning some, some forex, and so selling some tulips is a good thing. But there is a fundamental confusion of well, there's also exporting flowers when you're going to food. To take a Marxist perspective on it, uh, it's a class thing too. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the even if Ethiopia is richer uh, as a result of exporting this rice to Saudi Arabia or whatever, where's the money going? Yes. And it's, if it's going to the ruling class to buy fancy sports cars and take vacations in Europe, mm -hmm. which is generally the rule. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're growing tea or tulips or whatever for foreign for export, yeah. uh, you get hard currency, and you're not really interested in buying handicrafts made locally. Completely, completely. But this is, I mean, to say that and so the the rest of the country suffers. It's the it's only the elites that are plugged into the global markets, the hard yeah. currency sectors of the economy. This is what Nigeria and oil is the classic. I mean, I used to see that every day. Right? It's visual, the, the parts of somewhere like Nigeria or Ethiopia. Though Ethiopia is not, as far as it's not as big, but you can still see the parts of the country that are connected to the to these markets. So I, I totally agree with you that you, can have, you have a narrative. And maybe that's the problem. The it's not a question of who owns land, even. No. Make it productive. Yes. Which the Saudis appear to be doing. Yeah. But what's the final result? And say that's that involves uh, corruption and class warfare and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Building on that, I'm um, stuck on the, the image of the 20-something the who has the pride in the, the new job that they have and learning more about, yeah, not an actual image, but my best, I don't know if there actually was one, but I just said that an image of that as you were talking about. No, I made him up, yeah, okay. was <laughs> I'm curious, I mean, that, that sounds very positive. I mean, having something, you're, you're learning a, a skill, a certain, you know, a whole, um, you know, modernization of farming, but do you have a sense of, what percentage of people are then gaining those those skills? Few thousand I mean, people. Okay, which so I'm assuming is not many. And how is that building sort of a, a middle class? But then, what people are you leaving then in exchange that would have been able to live off that land in potentially abject poverty, and then having that like a mini um, subset of people between those who are very very wealthy and those who are now. Wealthy. I think these two comments connect. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a very small number of people. A few hundred feet trade. Some of them, there, there is. Okay. Um, I picture the green chapter, so. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is more accurate. I <laughs> um, no, there's a quote about Canada. That might so, no. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is a small number of people, but it's indicative of how, of, of how you could secure kind of social license. Mm -hmm. To do this kind of thing, 
but and and it's not as though if that farm wasn't there there would be loads of people making their living from that precise part of the land mm. which is mm. massive, massive absolutely um, it, it more comes back to this question of self-determination the, 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 the Gambellans have very little say in it because mm. some of the younger generation are benefiting and theoretically the top levels of the local government have approved of this but they tend to be stooges for Alice they tend to be co-opted not really represented at all so it comes back to the question of whether the people whose land this in the true sense is mm -hmm. um, are able to direct the local economy such that it benefits themselves as opposed to it being a kind of um, sort of, what do we say, sort of uh, kind of free market experiment in plugging a little bit of it into a global economy and it's not entirely clear to whom uh, who, who benefit from that, apart from these handful who are giving them the skills. So it's, it's difficult, it's delicate. Throughout, we found these kind of contradictory arguments. But no red tractors. No green tractors. Okay. Well, next time. Okay. Um, do the people know that their lands were taken because some were because of um, the international investment? I mean, do they exactly understand what it, what does it mean? Yeah. So yeah, I, Alan, I, people will say, who owns your land, Alan, you say Alan owns your land. Because I tried to imagine that if I were such a like, um, farmer with little education, I may feel like like my government took my land with no compensation and then it was sold it to the foreign um, companies and I was betrayed by my country. Because you know, in China, there are a lot of people burn themselves because of they, their lands were taken and with no compensation. But actually, our government didn't tell us that. Uh, because your topic in, in uh, reminds me that maybe it's because of the foreign um, investment, but we never know. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe it's a kind of strategy of the government that not telling you that because they don't want the people feel like they are betrayed. Well, telling people the foreign investors are coming because as a, as a cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's an added element. Yeah, no, it's a fascinating point. Uh, there's an added, added kind of wrinkle to this, which is that at the same time this is all going on, the government has this villagization policy, which is which happens in the in the, in the least developed parts of Ethiopia. Which are also regarded with great kind of disdain in a kind of deeply racist way by the by the high levels, towards the darker skinned low levels. And that this villagization policy, on the surface of it, is a, is a perfectly defensible idea that you've got nomadic groups and people who live in lots of tiny villages in the bush, and it's impossible for a well meaning government to provide schools and clean water and what have you to all these tiny little villages in the bush. You have to group them together into a bigger settlement. Um, so there's lots of forced movement going on through that, and the government says, oh, it's not that forced, you know, which is encouraging people. Um, but there are human rights watch reports of some horrific behavior by the military to enforce this criticization policy. So what is very hard to document, because, well, partly because, I mean, no one ever thinks about it, but Ethiopia's press freedom record is the same as Saudi Arabia's. I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredibly difficult place to report. Um, we don't really know the extent to which militarization is being done in good faith, or is a cover for moving people to free up land. Either for these big deals, or actually greater quantities of the land being given as for um, just for individual highlanders and a sort of political patronage, right, to, to for the elite to have their little dots of land in the, in the fertile area. Um, so the sense of whether this is a cover for people fearing they've been betrayed by the government. Every, the vast majority of people in, in Gambella they wouldn't expect anything else than betrayal of, from the Highlanders, except maybe, again, 
this Shiva generation. Maybe maybe there is a shift that's going on and people starting to feel Ethiopian, which is why we ended up being called the Ethiopian football strip. This is the first I think Anwak has started playing for the national team. And there are little things like that that are starting to to shift, but by and large betrayal is just what people Uh, you just said that it's a, a difficult place to report. Can you share some of the challenges you face along the way? Beginning with the visa and of course the you know, <laughs> with the land. And so it's, I, I've done years, many, many years of Africa, and uh, um, I got banned from one country once. <laughs> that I was in the middle of the Ivory Coast on the Bagbo in the middle of a war. And, but the Ethiopian process was pretty extraordinary. I mean, it's it's perfectly understandable. I mean, it's you know, it's you're asking for the, the privilege of being extended a visa. There's no reason these things should be automatic. Um, and it's within the country not to review. But they um, there was an awful lot of kind of discussion, bartering. We didn't want to become bartering, but we 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 had to go through. A long period of like scaling down our plans and not knowing if we were going for many, many months. And then once we were in, once we did get a visa, and we went in, we talked to the information minister who was there. He was very open. He said, "Yeah, okay, go down to Gambo, that's fine." Um, but one of the difficult things is we've been asked by some of the activists we spoke to beforehand to be incredibly careful about. Um, being seen by the security forces in Gambella talking to locals. Not for our own safety, although, I mean, some Swedish journalists have spent 14 months in jail in that time. But um, <coughs> for the safety of the <coughs> there have been, there's a case recently that's still going on. So there's a Kello who's in jail here, but there's also a guy with Pastor Onnit, who um, is another animal who worked as worked with the, a World Bank inspection team that did, did an investigation into stuff connected to villagization. And he worked as a, a fixer for journalists. And he got picked up and is in jail now as well um, under this anti-terrorism law. And it basically seems that anyone that the government targets who's connected to protests or public dissent about land policy, or more broadly, sort of vocal in uh, local Anwite intellectuals, they are getting rounded up and put in jail. Um, and so there's a sort of self imposed difficulty in reporting there, which is the, the uh, which, you know, I've got, I've got used to it over the years, but it's, it's so hard, and I'm sure you've had similar situations. Of, uh, you're right, yeah, I've just, you. You know, everyone thinks about source protection as being about having to meet someone in a car park and making sure that or a bar or a bar. <laughs> I mean, sort of the names never written down, whatever. But, but this and and but, and you know, to, to what to what extent is someone you're ultimately just box protecting? Really? To what extent is that a source to be protected? Well, of course, it's a source to be protected. Mm. And the damage that you can do just by being seen, just by that being the one guy by the side of the road that you talk to, the military see. I mean, it's it, it's incredibly de delicate and, and, and difficult. Similarly, that you do have a duty to try and report this guy's story as best you can. But part of that was part of the reason why we decided to do um, to focus that bit of the reporting on just to go to Gambella and to see the farm there, but also to make sure we had the opportunity to talk in outside of Ethiopia, to talk in Nairobi to a lot of refugees who could speak freely there, because sadly they all dream of going home as a refugee does, but. Their chances of going home are very slim. Yeah. Is that how that answers? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. If you could deliver policy recommendations to Adam Gambella, I know it's still fairly complex, but you might know more than anyone else in the subject. And a policy recommendation to the government of Gambella. Um, G Gambella, and then also the national government of Ethiopia. I'm really. Make a point of not doing that. Okay. Um, but we get to, I mean, I wrote this. I wrote this book all about oil and mining and corruption in Africa. And, God, and the, the New York 
time review that made us sort of, it was very kind, but also just said, why are there no solutions in this book? And the reason there are no solutions is because there are no solutions for poor <laughs> countries' problems about the incredibly complex global economy. Similarly, I mean, the, what we really set out to do with this was to interrogate these kind of painful contradictions. Like, you know, I've got a lot of time for Jamal Ackerman's arguments, but there's limits to, the, to how far you can go with that kind of free market approach in a place that is um, so uh, riven. Um, and the government of Gambella, to my understanding of it, isn't really responsive to the people of Gambella. I mean, there, there's been, there was one case of a governor who is accused of having been a stooge of the central government to such an extent that he was complicit in plotting for massacre. That's never been proven, but it shows you the kind of levels of distrust that there is of the kind of patsies who end up in, 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 in government. Um, one, I mean, there was an interesting policy idea that came from, not from me, but one of the guys, a guy called Khalid uh, Bomba, who's like, he's like a JP Morgan banker who now works in the, this government's kind of agricultural transformation agency, federal agency. Um, and he made a really interesting point, which was that the, um, which was to challenge the premise of the whole thing which is to say, why do we think that having big farms is the solution? Um, what evidence is there for that? And I, I spoke to, to a few old contacts who work in Canada, who are sort of deal makers and what have you, and, and, and also to um, a few old trouble, troublemaking contacts who, who like to um, go and stone things up, in, especially in West Africa. And they, um, it, it, it is kind of, it seems like a perfectly natural, natural assumption that that's the solution is to make, have to use sort of economies of scale, and so you can have lots of tractors and fertilizers and that kind of thing. But this guy Khaled, um, his argument is that in places like Taiwan, it's been, I've never been to Taiwan, and I, this might be rubbish, but the, his argument was that actually it's kind of a small hold of revolution is how you get to very, very solid sort of food security by kind of, uh, it's through spreading very simple but useful farming techniques and things like that. And that the, the kind of political and social difficulties of switching to huge farms are so, so massive that they can undermine the whole thing. Um, and I don't know, I'm not trying to have a policy recommendation for the whole thing, but you can <laughs> government maybe repeal the counter-terrorism law. <laughs> Maybe do one more? Right. Yeah, so the, one. there's a whole so. slew of efforts and initiatives to, to clean up global value chains through transparency efforts. Mm. Right? So responsible sourcing and tracing the... Absolutely, yeah. Dodd Frank, among other things. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it extends to environmental standards, labor standards. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think tracing the origin of land rights of land tenure isn't that shoe drop or is there any movement around that? Is the origin of them? So, but they, I mean, so trace it, so following the, like, the transfer of them. Like yeah, a, like the, a, as if it was the responsible procurement chain. of your supply that's coming from so from more land, from agricultural projects. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. the case of this Saudi company. I mean, you could, I or think any food company anymore. Yeah, or but I mean, you could extend it to mining companies or company, yeah, anywhere, anywhere you buy right. land, right? Big like big realtors who buy uh, big uh, like retail projects that buy land. Yeah. Stuff like that. There is there is something that started. It's got an incredibly long and boring name. The, the World Voluntary Land Sustainable, it's got all the right words in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Voluntary yeah. Guidelines, the VGGT. The V, sorry? GGT is Absolutely. the acronym. You can look it up, it's on the FAO website. It's like a terrible Z. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, they workshop those names and fisheries got to be in there. And yeah, they're just yeah, like yeah, adding yeah. things in. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's not the catchiest thing in the world, but yeah. it's a start, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, maybe you know, seem to know more about this than I do. <laughs> but they're, they're, I mean, they're, yeah. that's, that seems to me to be the response to this kind of panic, some of it overdone, some of it completely justified, about land grabs. So there is, and it, and it kind of resembles the EITI or the Kimberley process or what, one of these kind of voluntary industry schemes. Yeah. So it's, there's it's a, it along involves the same line. investors, it involves civil society groups, government. Mm. But specific to land tenure, 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Focused on the land, the land deals. And so that has started. Maybe uh, as a final question, I just sort of ask you what, what did you get any responses um, to this article and, and your work from Saudi Star, Ethiopian government, anything? Ethiopian government is definitely silence. Um, <laughs> Jamal, Jamal from um, Saudi Star said, you know, fair play, really. You know, I was I'm glad we got to air a bit of our argument here. Um, the um, Omar to the Swift police to be given some time of day. <laughs> um, and the main thing that's interesting, I think, is the very little time. Well, um, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a personal story of um, Okello, the guy who's in jail. His son was here and has been campaigning hard. And he wrote an extraordinary letter to the paper a couple of days after this came out. Um, about his father and his role in trying to defend land rights and his kind of show trial, as I would say. Um, and it seems to be, I've been trying, been asking people at State and the NSC, apparently are involved in this, but maybe, maybe are, maybe aren't, uh, whether there'll be some, some lobbying so that he is not just locked up and the key thrown away. <laughs> so there's, yeah, there's, there's been some ramifications, I hope. Mm -hmm. yeah, really nice. All right, so uh, join me in thank you, Tom. <laughs> yes, we're uh, adjourned. Cheers, yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what we work on. Okay. Uh, and we've uh, been trying various ways to bring light to the topic that's not. I think discussed as much as it could be. Yeah, and that's something you should be um, concerned about.